you ever feel like a plastic bag drifting through the wind wanting to start again? Welcome to a brand new episode of Movies and Me, and this time, fellow YouTuber and movie critic, Mr. Movies is joining me all the way down under to talk American Beauty, and he's gotten up at 7.45am just to record with me. How you doing, buddy? Welcome to the show. I'm very tired. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wouldn't call myself a fellow YouTuber. I do it couple times maybe and i have 70 subscribers yes sounds great um no i i i dabble but thank you for that lovely intro i think i've never been given a greater intro actually people just say yeah here's, here's chris I'm like eh, hey <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that so, so yeah. in australia it's getting way colder so i really want to sleep like, it's, it's just like you want to just cuddle up and get your blankets and like, no, I'm not coming out today. I'm just going to stay in bed. <laughs> yeah, you and Sam Catlin would make great friends. He's always in his bed. Anyways, <laughs> um, American Beauty. I was surprised that you picked this out of, for the movie that's personal to you. So I got to know, buddy, what is it about American Beauty that's so personal to you as a film fan? Well, I first watched it when I was uh, 16. Um, and background, my parents in Christmas of 2011 gave me, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll show you. The, the, uh, the listeners can't, can't see this, but I was given 1001 movies to see before you die. And I thought, okay, that's cool. And I read this thing a hundred million times over and over again to the point that the spine is coming away and I'm afraid it's going to just explode in a mass of pages. It's a dope so book. I kept, yeah, it is. It is. Um, I got the 2010 edition, so I kept reading it through and I came to American Beauty. Now, I'd seen the image that a lot of people know about, which is uh, uh, the girl in the rose petals, which, you know, that, that's, that's, an, that's a very famous image and I've always seen that. And I'd heard the title in passing. So I gave, it a, I gave it a crack. And what I saw just completely changed me. Um, this was still at the time when I was, I was just really getting into film. I had just finished high school, gone into university. It was a very different time. Around that same time, I saw The Usual Suspects. That blew me away. And just I kept thinking about American Beauty and, and its power and its simplicity characters, uh, the fact that Kevin Spacey was just this amazing. It just made me fall in love with Kevin Spacey, made me fall in love with uh, Annette Benning and it's just, and Chris Cooper as well. It was just, oh, every nearly every performance, great or small, in this film just shocks you. And it comes down to the writing, comes down to the direction. It just comes down to these actors being great and then being in a great project which really came out of nowhere because uh, the director, Sam Mendes, was a theatre director before. This was his first ever film. And for a lot of people, they'll be like, oh, what is he doing? Like, you know, it would be very, very, very strange. For a lot of studios, it was actually pretty scary, and especially for this one because this was DreamWorks, which at that time, they didn't make Shrek yet. So everyone was like, what's this DreamWorks thing? This is going to fall flat on its ass. Why is Spielberg teaming up with David Geffen and Jeffrey Katzenberg? Like, uh, what? So DreamWorks was a little worried about this movie because of the first-time director, because it was also a first-time writer with Alan Ball. And the subject matter was just very strange, very dark. But when it came out, it made $300 million worldwide and won, and won five Oscars, including Best Picture and Best Director. Like, that's just, it's just a perfect way to show people this is what a first time director can truly do. And also, I feel that right now with Get Out, Ooh. same sort of thing. First time director comes straight out of the gate and you're just shocked by his passion, his audacity, his clear eye. And you get to feel this guy is going to be something huge in this scene because they're making something original. Uh, and American Beauty and Get Out, that would make quite the double feature. Oh, God. Ugh. <laughs> mm. Like, they're both... That's the thing, and they are more similar than, than most people would probably think at first class because they're both dark, but they're also incredibly funny. I can watch American Beauty, and every time Kevin Spacey 
is sitting there listening <laughs> listening to American Woman, getting high and try and try and sing to it and ordering burgers. And even before that, with his wife having an affair with with uh, the real estate king, like, yeah, okay, can I swear on your show? Yeah, of course. Go over it. You're Australian, okay. Where she, you know, she's like, oh, fuck me, Majesty. I just, I, I, that kills me every single time I've seen it. And it's just, it's, and there's so many other scenes that just, that make me laugh so much. But it also it captures my heart. And that is what a perfect movie does for me. It can make me giggle and it can make me just completely scared and shocked and leave me just in this puddle of, of fear and tears and, stuff <laughs> well i'm really glad that you picked this because i think me and you have this in common we were talking about this earlier when we were talking about guardians 2 i love simple plots executed well with great characters because i'm one of those guys that believes you can enrich a simple plot by having unique characters but you cannot make a complex plot and have boring characters and american beauty is one of those movies that has the line between both. It's got a really intriguing storyline about this guy having a midlife crisis and all that kind of stuff. And the way it's shot is beautiful. And it's also got really great yeah. characters, not just Kevin Spacey, like um, everybody else in the movie kills it too. Like Chris Cooper especially surprised me. Yeah. And I wanted to get your opinion on this because I was looking at uh, some trivia for this movie. And it says here that Sam Mendes actually designed the two girls' look to change over the course of the film. So... You have the friend gradually using less makeup and uh, his daughter gradually using more. And that was to emphasize their view of shifting perceptions of themselves. So was that is that something that you noticed when you watched it? Or have I just blown your freaking mind right now? I've seen this movie like, like 20 times and I've never noticed that. Holy shit. Oh, but that's so perfect. I mean, I might have noticed it like just a little bit. Now I'm thinking about it, that makes a little bit more sense. Like I'm thinking when... Yeah, you know, like the the climactic scene where Angela and Lester kind of come together, and yeah, you can see on her face here she does have this makeup. But that's just see that's the thing that this movie was you saying that that just instantly reminds me of Fight Club because those two movies, these two movies have a lot in common because they both came in in nineteen ninety nine. They both deal with like you know fading masculinity and a lot of capitalist themes. Pretty much exactly what the nineties were about, and that's what I think. There is a lot of people off about this movie, and maybe it's when people go back, like a nostalgia critic, did a review on it. Like it does, uh, pretty much does American Beauty hold up? And he said, yes, it's a good movie, but it's very nineties. See, that's what I love about it because it's just like this nice little kernel of everything that the nineties were about. If they just had a little bit of like grunge music in there, that would have just been that would just make the entire cake just more. 90s perfect but this movie and fight club shared similarities with that because uh you noticed that throughout the film of fight club because they shot it chronologically they made edward norton go out in sun less so he would become paler and paler and brad pitt would go out to tanning salons so he'd become like you looking like this tan god because that's what his character is meant to be he's meant to be this adonis this perfection of everything that um, capital law america was all about and edward norton was you know the lonely man left to the side the one that no one cares about and it just those themes resonate through this movie through fire club and just pretty much a lot of movies that came out in 99 that's why i think it's probably one of the best years of movies just in general yeah it's definitely one of the best up there and what we usually do in the show is that we talk about like uh, some favorite scenes or maybe a moment that kind of encapsulates the movie for you. So what's that for you? If you can name one scene that you think, oh my God, this is just fucking great. Say, even you've got me swearing now because this movie is oh, fucking yeah. great. What would you choose? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, there is so many moments. Um, yeah, God, that's, that's really, really hard. I didn't have to think about that. I mean, my first... Yeah, my first answer really is the the scene that I just said with uh, Lester, Angela, who you know he's been desiring her for this entire movie, and she's kind of playing into it because she's that kind of person. She's like, "Oh hi, you know, you're a you're a forty five year old man. I think I'll 
think I'll have a piece of that. Like, hell yeah. It did make and, me uncomfortable when I first saw it, I won't lie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and Boom, actually, really the entire scene, not just them coming together, the moment where they finally, you know, slowly move together, but just everything about that entire scene is so perfect. Not only is the cinematography beautiful because it was Conrad L. Hall, who is an absolute master. He did the cinematography for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. This movie won two Oscars for both of those and then did Road to Perdition, which was same director, Sam Mendes, uh, and that's a great film. Nonetheless, I really wish I talked about that. Um, but that was his last film, and he won the Oscar for Best Cinematography posthumously. His son went up to uh, receive it for him, and you can just... I just he is one of my favorite. He didn't do that much in his career of like complete note except for just American Beauty and Bush Cassidy, but he was so just unique and the way that he would move his camera and the way that he would position shots was so gorgeous and then especially in the scene. And what pretty much underscores the whole moment and makes it just hit me and actually does really just get me super emotional every time I watch it is because they're playing um, Annie Lennox's uh, oh, she, what's the song called? Is it Sweet Dreams? This one? No, no, no. It's and, not Sweet and, Dreams. I'm going to think. It is, it's an Annie Lennox song and it is called Oh my god, what am I, what am I, what's going on? Welcome to Movies and Me Karaoke. I've listened to this song a million times. <laughs> oh, hang on, hang on. It's it's right here. Let's let's see. Anyway, it says, don't let it bring you down. Oh god, thank you. That right, kind of encapsulates the movie, the title of that song, Don't Let It Bring You Down. Yeah. That's really cool. And so, Annalex says, don't let it bring you down. It's a beautiful song. And it's playing throughout this entire moment because Angela's not on the radio. And it's just a song that's pretty much just about don't let shit bring you down. Don't let something that you thought was going to be amazing just tear you down. You can be stronger. You can you can push it through to the end. And just listen to it on its own. It's fantastic. And in this moment, you're seeing Angela just being completely just shot. Just, she's nothing because... Uh, uh, Jane has just told her you're nothing basically and she is still vulnerable she's not trying to seduce Lester she is emotionally and physically vulnerable and whether the camera zooms in as they both walk into each other and in the, in the center of just just between them is a bowl of roses and you see that throughout the entire film pretty much nearly every frame of this movie has the color red in it. So many scenes, pretty much nearly every scene has roses in it, which is an amazing thing. It's like it's like saying, oh, in Inception, you have to notice if Dom's wedding, wearing his wedding ring the entire time and you want to go back and you want to watch it and you want to pick out those moments. And that's exactly what I did. I heard about how there was roses in every scene and I went back and there are, and it's amazing. And, it, and it's right there in this scene. And even when they do come together, you think they're actually going to, you know, do something like, oh, what's what's going on? And then she tells him, I'm a virgin. And it's like, whoa. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, that did oh, surprise oh, me as well I when I saw it. Beautifully. And even, even the following scenes when he's just giving her, I think, she, I think he gives her ice cream afterwards. It's so and innocent it's like, compared yeah, to everything else. And it, exactly. And that's, it's so perfect. It's such a perfect, perfect scene. There's so many other ones that I could that I could name that are just as fantastic, but that that's the climax of the movie, and it's a fantastic climax. It's everything that this movie has been building up to, and it's still everything that it stands for, even as you find out the truth. I, I love that. That is why it's so great because it's perfectly directed. And um, like we said before, it's not only perfectly directed, but it has great characters and. My favorite scene in this movie, uh, I'm sure I'm sure you've got a great take on it as well. Uh, we notice for a lot of this movie that uh, Wes Bentley and Chris Cooper, they play father and son, but they don't get along very well. Chris Cooper's like the kind of 
the stereotypical redneck dad type and he's like so angry yeah. whenever you bring up anything that's like against his traditionalist views and then near the end once uh, lester is kind of like really confident in himself he's attracted the attention of chris cooper's character who then kisses him in the garage and the moment is just oh, so yeah. small like i always love small moments that kind of give you a big meaning and with this it's like oh kevin space he's getting self-confident he's looking better but you can tell at that moment he feels like i'm attracting the attention of the wrong people and that just blew my mind and it made me want to rewatch it like several times after and i, I freaking oh, love american sense. beauty that I would see that's an, I was gonna say that moment. And a lot of people, if you if they watch this movie, they'd say, Oh, the plastic bag and the wind moment. So that's a great moment. But I think I feel like it's just so played out. Because right? when this movie came out, everyone was talking about that. And now it's become this this thing. You see that and you think about this movie. Whereas I like doing that. I like looking at moments that people don't talk about. You know, I have favorite scenes in The Godfather that no one else would say that's their favorite scene. Although, actually, pretty much every scene in that movie is people someone's favorite, so it <laughs> doesn't really count. But I like just looking beyond the norm. I like looking beyond the thing that everyone is talking about and seeing something deeper. And I see that with this movie, and especially with that scene as well. That shocked me the first time I saw it. And the only flaw, the only tiny little flaw for me about this film is what was left out because apparently Sam Mendes uh, shot a flashback scene for Chris Cooper's character and what it was was him in uh, the Marines or in when he was uh, when he was in the military and it shows him actually having a sexual relationship with another uh, uh, officer with another man so he was hiding this really painful desire behind this facade of the Republican, you know, super conservative ex-military man who's like, oh, those queers, those fags, you know, oh, that's just disgusting. He's like, yeah, but I seriously, you know. <laughs> also, like, if I was, sorry, if I was him and I had Alison Janney's character who just doesn't talk as all, at, at, at all the entire movie except for like a couple of words yeah I turn gay because like you're getting nothing from her she's just she's comatose the entire time <laughs> also because that's your fault as well because you've just completely you obviously completely belittled her and that's what I was saying as well before how every performance uh, great or small in this movie is fantastic because you have Kevin Spacey just doing amazing work and Annette Benning and Annette Benning was robbed of the Oscars for that year. I can't remember who won for 99, but she was completely robbed. She, that was one of the best performances I've ever seen her give, one of the best female performances. She's just so powerful, especially when she's trying to clean the house and she doesn't sell it and she just sits there and just cries. It's just so, it's just, it's just a small little moment that I absolutely love and also kind of makes me laugh even though it's kind of sad that she's just really lonely. But also, small performances, Alex and Jenny, who is an amazing actress. I've seen her in so many different things, and she is here, and she doesn't really do that much to the plot, but every time you see her, you just feel exactly what she's feeling, which is just nothing. There's no expression, and that's, that's really powerful. That goes down to uh, Alan Ball's writing as well, to just make this small character feel important to the other characters as well. But just going back to, again, I ramble. I ramble a lot. That's what the show's <laughs> for, man. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's that's the only thing I, I, I would say should have been kept in. I think it would have been a really distracting to audiences to have this flashback scene. But it once you know that, makes that moment so much more powerful but on its own it still is a very confusing in a good way moment it makes you really think like what the hell was that all about and you and like you said you want to really watch it like what's going on what is it what what, what? 
Yeah, because I feel like that that's how you do a good twist. You don't do something that's going to completely just flip it on its head that it doesn't make sense. you got to pepper, like, little breadcrumbs kind of through there. And I, mean, I love that you mentioned up his wife as well, because I thought that was a nice contrast between Chris Cooper and his wife to Kevin Spacey and his wife. Because if you look at the power struggle there, Kevin Spacey's the one who's like, I don't feel comfortable, I'm being used, and my wife wears the pants here, whereas... Chris Cooper and his wife, you don't really know who's wearing the pants there. He likes to think that he is. But then once Kevin Spacey gets more confident, that makes Chris Cooper kind of feel more insecure about himself in a way. And it was a really nice little role reversal that I noticed as well. I mean, there's a lot of great things in this movie that are so small. Mm. I'd like to ask, I'll ask you a question, even though you're host and I'm the guest, but I'll ask you a question. Go for it. Is, can you... Uh, fault this movie for anything in your mind um not right away i mean like i guess maybe it takes a little while to get going but that's a very minor minor flaw i i could watch this movie pretty much any time it's and if there's any minor flaw i'd say it takes a while to get going and since you brought it up um the fucking uh the flashback scene. I think that would have added to the character a bit more, but you have to show it afterwards, not before, because then it'll just confuse the audience and it'll make that twist less of a reveal. Mm. Mm. But even even if, if they did show it afterwards, that would have kind of interrupted the flow of that third act because every moment after the other just feels so important and so impactful. And the fact that, that all of this is happening you know, the, the the dad comes in and and he's in, he sees Lester in the garage and he goes upstairs. And at the same, like, at the same time, they're having their garage moments. There's there's uh, Angela and, and Jane and, and Ricky. They're doing their own, you know, conflicting thing. And they're, they're so close to each other. Like, like that's I love movies like that where shit's happening up here and then some big stuff's happening over here. And there's also stuff over here, and like it's all in this one space where you don't, when no one interrupts each other. It's just like wow. That just it, it, it makes the dramatic tension so much more. But you you keep thinking at any moment someone's gonna walk in and just be like, whoa, what the fuck's going on here? But they don't. They just just are there. And we all occupy the same space, you know. Lester goes in the living room, and Angela comes down, and Jane and Ricky stay up there. And, you know, he, uh, uh, Chris Cooper goes next door and, and gets the gun. And it's just, love it. That's so <laughs> I love great. that. But like I said, if that flashback really would have just kind of just really interrupted the whole flow of everything. It just would have came, again, if you did it before, it would have confused people. If you did it after, it just would have been like, See, that was, and I think people would have felt like that was just there just to explain this moment, just because they were afraid people would be confused. Whereas the moment itself, as it is, just throws you out there and wants you to question it. And it, it, it's, all, it's ambitious. It's ambition to just put it out there and not have to explain it. That's pretty much like reverse David Lynch. Because he puts things out there and then doesn't give what's none no explanation whatsoever. He doesn't care. He's just like, yeah, there you go. Figure it out for yourself. I don't even know what it meant. Like, what the hell? Just explain it, you crazy man. <laughs> Sorry, David. David Lynch kind of pisses me off a lot. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, since you mentioned explain it, uh, you've listened to the show before. You know this little feature. Before you kill me. I want you to imagine that I've never seen American Beauty. What do you tell me to get me to watch it right away? Want to get you to watch it right away? Hell yeah. I love these responses where it's just silence. I would say yes. Because not only is it the best picture winner, so it has that kind of uh, uh, power behind it, like that kind of hype. That people can think, like, okay, yep, yeah, it won Best Picture. All right. I think it's weird that a lot of people say, oh, no, it shouldn't have won Best Picture. The Green Mile should The Green Mile's three hours long, okay? And it's got magic in it. It's very weird, but it's great. 
very weird. And like, oh, the Matrix should have won. Piss off. Piss off, the Matrix should have won. The Matrix is, is like, is hailed, but like, it's really good. But that movie is completely dampened by the shit sequels. So would I get you to watch it? I mean, what do you t- what do you tell me to get me to watch it? Do I have to kill you though? Can't you just die of a sad illness? <laughs> I'd rather not. Um, I'd rather not. You you ate some you ate some blowfish <laughs> and you're gonna die. <laughs> uh, one fish, two fish, poison fish. <laughs> uh, poison, poison. <laughs> Simpsons reference. There you go. Uh, um, but yes, it would because. This movie has so much in it, and even when it even when it ends, and usually that end note would be really just so sad to see. I mean, this is spoilers for the movie, but really, if if you don't want spoilers, don't watch this episode. Don't watch the movie and come back. What are you doing? Stop. Just to any person who's there watching this episode who's never seen the movie, stop. You're stupid. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um. But yeah, this movie just feel it just has so much behind it. It has so much power. It has so much emotion. It has darkness. And like I said, when it ends, and you have Lester being shot and killed, and he's dead on the kitchen counter, you still feel like he's let go, and everything is perfect now. You see his his flashbacks and in the rain and the whole thing as. Uh, you, you might not understand this, but someday you will. And it's like, that's just such a great way to end it. It's so satisfying. There's there's not that much that's left hanging. Everything's pretty much answered for better or for worse. And I mean, if I was about, if I was going to die the next day, this is definitely the film that I would watch. I mean, I wouldn't watch. Like, I love Star Wars, but I wouldn't watch Empire Strikes Back because. It ends on this, like, it ends on a cliffhanger. I want to go watch Return of the Jedi after it. Like, no! I want to watch, there's a, there's a guy, I mean, this is, this is kind of dark, but like, there's a guy who, a huge Star Wars fan, he had a terminal illness, and he was shown for Star Wars Force Awakens just before he died. And that's great, but also, oh my god, that's really bad. Because that means that he's going to die without finding out what Luke said, and it's like, Oh, that's really depressing. Really, really depressing. <laughs> oh well, uh, I think I think that'll um, that should wrap us up. Uh, thank you, dude. Thanks so much for coming on my show and talking this great movie. You've made me want to go rewatch it again, even though I saw it a couple of days ago to prepare for this episode. Uh, Is this your first time watch of this movie, or have you seen it before? Uh, I saw it uh, two years ago for film class, and I rewatched that again for okay. this. So uh, where where can the good people find you? And is there anything that you want to plug? Um, you can find me on Twitter at I am the movie god. Uh, you can find me on YouTube if you search Mr. Movies because you can't find me with youtube.com slash Mr. Movies because I don't have that many subscribers yet. <laughs> um, so if you type in Mr. Movies, I'll be there. It's my face with a lightsaber just going like, hey, yeah, people can't see that. Um, Keep forgetting that, but um, something to plug. I saw Alien Covenant on Thursday. I'm going to try and get a review out for that um, maybe Monday ish if I have time because uh, I'm just super busy this weekend. That's why I found it a lot is that now I'm doing YouTube. I find that whenever I want to do a review, I always have that little voice that says, Nah, you don't want to do that. Go do something else. Like, no, no, I keep getting distracted and I and I keep thinking about, oh, no, that means I have to edit it and I have to put all this shit in there because, you know, our mind's video. It, the audio is so much easier to do because you don't have to edit out those those mistakes that you do with your face and you don't have to, like, re-record an entire thing eight times just because you didn't mention one bloody thing. <laughs> but I, I have fun with it. Um, so, yeah, Alien Covenant, um, I'm going to do... I'm going to try and do Pirates of the Caribbean review for all... Five comes out. If not, that's just because I really didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, I, I will be doing uh, Star Wars reviews uh, every month, same as Chris Duckman did before Force Awakens. I'm going to do one every month before The Last Jedi, including uh, Clone Wars TV show and the movie. Uh, might even just throw in the Rebels in there. Might just do a full episode all about that. Um, 
but just I personally want to do reviews of them because I have my own opinions of them. And even though episode one is the most analyzed film in the, in the history of the world, I have my own thoughts about it because I grew up with it. I was five when that movie came out and that was, I watched that so many times. So that's my feeling about it. A lot of other people were like, you know, 30 odd and they were like 20 when they saw the movie and they hated it then and they hate it now, but I'm different. So I want to try and make that difference felt. Other than that, there's not that much else. So hit me, on, hit me up on Twitter and, and give me a like on all my stuff. So thank you, good listeners. Love you all. Yeah, and uh, you've, you've been a great guest, buddy. This is going to be a really fun episode for me to edit. And uh, if you guys uh, want to continue the conversation, please use the hashtag Movies and Me or leave us a comment below. And next week, we're going to be talking the Grand Budapest Hotel with special guest Claire Lefton. So I really can't wait to get into that with her. And if you guys like this show, hit the subscribe button, and I will see you guys next time.